What's going on, Internet? I'm Christopher Peterson, and you're listening to the Nerd EXP Gamecast. This week, I'm hanging out with Alex. Hello. And Brooks. Hey. Each week, members of the gaming community get together and go through the top entertainment headlines to help you level up your gaming IQ. Uh, this is Alex's first time on the show, so let's give him uh, an opportunity to kind of introduce himself and talk. Uh, I'm Alex. I've been playing video games since I was roughly three. My brother just kind of threw a Nintendo 64 controller in my hand. And uh, I know I want to be a writer. I know I like to be involved with video and audio recording. So just kind of moving into games press is something that interests me. I write for Gamnesia, maybe a site some of you read or not, but heavily Nintendo-based, but we're definitely branching out a lot over the past few months, really. So uh, I'm glad to be here, though. Uh, thanks, Alex. Definitely glad to have you on. Uh, as always, listeners come first. Uh, so we have a listener question from Twitter. That guy in line asks, what is your favorite video game based on a movie? When I read this question, I physically felt ill uh, because there are so many bad movie tie-in games. Uh, but then I calmed down and I thought about it for a second and... Uh, first answer that immediately jumped to mind was Spider-Man 2. That game got web swinging down and making you feel like Spider-Man and being in the city, and just kind of that open world environment, um, perfect. And probably no other Spider-Man game has been able to replicate that to that same level of uh, fidelity and greatness. Alex? Uh, it's, that's like a difficult one for me. But I'm going to still say, just because I loved it as a kid, but I really want to go back and see. There was a King Kong game based off the Peter Jackson adaptation of King Kong. And it was actually, like, part first-person shooter than, like, other times he plays King Kong. I don't know if I just loved it because I was a kid and I got to play as King Kong, but I just remember that one. And, I mean, that's just the one off the top of my head. I know I mentioned GoldenEye. And I still, I think that's just a fun game to kind of sit down every now and then. Remember, the only way to play Goldeneye is on paintball mode. If you don't have that yeah, cheat code, you're not playing it right. It's like a, it's like the first platoon. Now that I think about it, uh, what about you, Brooks? One of my favorites would be Lion, the Lion King for the Sega Genesis. It's a combination side scroller and platformer. Great music, great gameplay. A little difficult in a few spots, but ultimately fun. Something I can go right back to and play just as have as much fun as I did when I first played it. Uh, a little difficult. That game was hard as balls. I can never get past the stupid, like, giraffe platforming with their heads and the alligator. Yeah, wait to be king, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I make so. a prediction that my new favorite game based off of a movie will probably be the Mad Max game Avalanche Studios making. Because I love that studio. I love Just Cause. And I just feel like they want to throw a cool vibe on that franchise. I'm really looking forward to that. I'd probably like Ratchet and Clank myself. Uh, yeah, Ratchet and Clank uh, definitely looks great. Um, and we can jump straight into that. Uh, plays, jumping into the news, uh, Ratchet and Clank, kind of a re-release, up-res. It's, the, it's a weird concept for a game. Um, but they kind of summarize it almost perfectly in the reveal trailer on the PlayStation blog. Uh, it's the, This is the Ratchet and Clank game based on the Ratchet and Clank movie, which is based on the first Ratchet and Clank game from the PlayStation 2. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I, I like the Ratchet and Clank series, um, and you know this makes me excited. It looks like a Pixar film uh, as a video game. Uh, I think this is the closest thing that Sony has to that kind of recognizable franchise and, and character and world building. Um, and, you know, I, it's not just an up res model, like they are adding in um, weapons that were not in the first game and levels and, you know, maybe they'll even tweak the plot and story a little bit to streamline it and not make it uh, exactly what it was beforehand. Um, it's a weird move, but I think it's a good move. What about you, Brooks? Uh, I like the idea that there's going to be a lot, a lot of new weapons. There's supposed to be new planets to explore. The controls are supposed to be different. Additional boss fights. And uh, a sweet a sweet uh, pre-order bonus. 
you get the bouncer. It's a weapon that allows you to shoot off a of, uh, shoot off a bomb. It opens up and shoots off smaller bombs, and then you track all the enemies and just blow them to hell. It's a great weapon. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> mentioning the pre-order bonus, um, like unrelated to Ratchet and Clank. Do you guys ever pre-order games still? Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Stopped one a long time ago. Yeah. Mm-mm. Why'd you stop? This has this good unity. <laughs> That's a good reason to stop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think as a, as a culture of gaming, um, you know, and I and I've pre-ordered games before. I pre-ordered Mass Effect Three. That was the last game I pre-ordered. Um, not for any particular reason, uh, but because it was just last game that I was like ridiculously excited for. And then I just realized that I can wait. I should wait. Uh, I should wait for reviews. I should wait to see if I'm done playing the games that I have in my library currently and see if there is uh, something better out there or just get that same game that's cheaper when I'm in a better place to. And I don't know. I'm kind of over the feeling that you have to pre-order to be part of the game and to get that kind of day one and get the full experience. And surprisingly, like, you can pretty much still get the pre-order bonus even when you buy the game sometimes. Like, it's yeah. in there. That's happened to me multiple times. All right. Um, moving on, uh, another news. Uh, Sonic is coming out with another game, Sonic Boom, Fire and Ice. Have you guys ever played any of the Sonic Boom series? No, because I've been no. told not to. I'll be you... honest, I didn't even know it was a Sonic Boom series out. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's pretty popular. Um, not necessarily Sonic Boom the series, but there's a uh, cartoon that it's also based off of and that's yeah. apparently getting great reviews and kids love it. So they're shifting all Sonic branded adventures into that kind of universe and that feel. Um, do you guys care about Sonic at all? I'm a big Sonic fan, but I don't think I want to buy a 3DS just to play one game. That's definitely fair. Uh, Joe, do you have any opinions or thoughts on Sonic Boom? You are hilarious. <laughs> Sonic Boom. I'm not sure. Uh, it certainly can go away. That's and that's, that's fair. fair. I've I've tried. The honest, but well, not totally fair. I've only tried all of five minutes of each of the Sonic games that aren't you know since Dreamcast, but they're all uh, terrible in my mind. So uh, yeah. They, they can go away. That's fine by me. I never played Sonic the Dreamcast series, but even Sonic 1, like, that... I don't know if Sonic's ever been good, actually. Like, I tried to replay that on the PlayStation Network uh, when it was free from PS Plus, and for, the game's all about speed, but then you're constantly stopping and waiting for shit to go up and down the platform. It's, it's a weird concept. Yeah, like, I remember... I have plenty of memories with the game. You know, like, my cousin had the Sega Genesis... Uh, most of my cousins were who had like you know any type of 8-bit uh, gaming consoles. Like I had the N64, that was my first console. But uh, so any games before that, I experienced with other people. And Sonic was I associate with my cousin, and uh, we had great times with it. And he had all the games; he was obsessed. But I mean, then I hear plenty of people online talking about the games, and it's like nobody likes them. And I was I was confused by that. So I actually grabbed a copy of I think like Sonic Two, the, whichever one could go with Sonic and Knuckles, that uh, that double yeah, cartridge um, thing. One, two, and three could go with it. Right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I think, it, but I, it doesn't matter. I got two or something from some retro store, and I hooked up to my Hyperkin, the uh, the the retro uh, yeah, console they made. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, it's terrible. It's like you're just constantly like, this is awesome. Oh, and then I lose everything. I stop. All the momentum's gone. Yeah, I. it's funny how, like, you know, you could be blinded just by, you know, being a kid and not knowing better and having a cousin that, you know, swears it's the best game ever. So, yeah, Sonic is an interesting memory to have since it's actually not a great game. All right. Um, kind of moving on into that still retro feel, uh, Capcom announced a Mega Man collection that's going to be Mega Man 1 through 6. I feel like the the general 
a gut reaction from everybody is why not one through ten? I mean, I remember hearing this only on uh, Colin and Greg live, and I trust Colin with implicitly with anything that is Mega Man because you know he's beaten all of them, and I've beaten zero of them. You know, I be I I have Mega Man two on my P PlayStation Vita, and it's it's absurdly hard. I can't beat it. Uh, it's the like it's the Rockman version, like the Japanese version. So I don't know if that's hard or anything, but either way, I can't beat it. I'm terrible. Um, Colin said, Colin Moriarty on uh, Colin Greg Live stated that this was the right move, in his opinion, because those were the better games. And then, uh, and, and those are actually the more uh, time-specific games, right? Like the other games, some of the later games were actually released after they had left that uh, generation or something like that, if, the, if I'm remembering correctly. I'm not sure what the story is with those later games. Yeah, one th one through six are uh, NES games, and then uh, seven is Super Nintendo, and then eight is PlayStation, and nine and ten are um, kind of the retro classics that we have. Um, not to put you on the spot, Alex, like you're kind of a younger kid. Have you ever played any of the Mega Man games, or do you, does this collection uh, interest you? Definitely, mainly due to having an older brother who like grew up with those. So pretty much a lot of the games he touched, they came to me. Um, Occasionally, I do actually own like a Mega Man shirt, and it's just like generic has Mega Man says Mega Man. It is interesting to run to people, and they're like, I have no idea what that is. Then you meet <laughs> still other people my age, and like, I know what that is, and it's cool that you know what that is too. Um, but still, even as like this, we were discussing earlier, like if I like met somebody that had never played Mega Man ever, like this might be something cool for them. But for like people I know that play Mega Man, usually still have it in some form. Like I have some of the games on my 3DS, so. Like, why would I really need to get, you know, one through six on PlayStation 4 or something? I just want to say tangentially that I love how video games, like retro video games now, like T-shirts of them are becoming sort of like bands. We're like, if yeah. you wear the shirt, I mean, I'm not, I'm not rocking on you, but I like the idea, like, yeah, man, Mega Man was the way, but, like, some people could be posers and they might end up even played the game, but they wear it because they think it's cool. Yeah, like, that's that. that's something that we're not far away from. That's pretty dope. Yeah, that's getting out there because I mean, like, I have an Alter Beast shirt. I've barely met any other people no, that game played hard. that game. That game is hard. <laughs> I skipped Alter Beast, so I've never heard anything good about it. Mm. Uh, Brooks, do you have any opinions on this Mega Man news? Well, I'm a big Mega Man fan, but um, I'm not too impressed with this this particular collection. If you've never played the games and you have a PS4, you want to give it a shot, go for it. I mean, you, you can't go wrong. It's, they're nice games. But you just don't, I just don't think you get enough for you know what they're offering. A museum mode that lets you get art and things and Mega Man 1 through 6 doesn't seem to be enough. I mean, what's... This is like they're not on Vita. Like, am I hearing that right? They're, they're, there's not going to be any cross by. There's not going to be any Vita ports of this. Uh, I have no idea. That's see, that's what that's what's worrying me. Because a lot of these games, a lot of these games are available already on if, if virtually if you on on like the Vita, 3DS, PlayStation, some of everything. You can already get them. Yeah, I mean, um, with, with this announcement and kind of a lot of the announcements that we're going to go through, uh, and we've already mentioned. Um, you know, details are scarce. Like, this almost feels like a lot of teaser announcements. We are definitely in the middle of E3, um, and I know we kind of did our E3 predictions, but, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, man, they're getting all this news, they're getting all these announcements, they're getting all these stories out of the way. I hope they're right, but I almost feel like we're going to see a lot of the same stuff that we're talking about today just brought back again uh, during the E3 conferences. Uh, there's something I want to add. For Mega Man 2, master the Mega Buster, master your timing, and learn the patterns of the bosses, and you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the only one of the like, the only one of those games that feels almost impossible to beat is Mega Man 1. Like, I, I never could beat that game. That game is almost punishingly hard. It is the definition of NES like hard. You you can't sit there and eventually get it. Like, you either have the skills, or you don't to be able oh, to beat yeah, game. expected to die quite a few times so you get the, the timing down, because that collision is terrible. You get wasted very quickly. 
the only thing I can say about the collection is like I I would have been excited if it was coming to Vita. You know, honestly, retro games it's harder for me to just sit down and and actually commit time to them when all these other you know uh, new indies or like AAA titles are coming out. I would love to play it on my Vita though. You know, and yeah, there most of these games are available on the Vita. But like I said, the only uh, version of Mega Man 2 available to download on the Vita is like the PlayStation 1 like port, and it's really old looking. You have to stretch out the screen in order for it to, to go full screen. And it's the Japanese version. I don't know what the hell anything's saying. You know, it's like, it's he's Rockman, not Mega Man. I'm like, what's happening? So, you know, I would have loved to see, you know, the, the collection come to the Vita for one, you know, bundled price. But uh, I guess I'm probably just going to Skip out on this one. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, with, with that, uh, you don't need to see the language. It's Mega Man. It barely matters. Right, yeah. Um, moving on, uh, just another uh, news announcement. Uh, Tales of Bergia uh, announced for PlayStation 3 and 4. Um, this is the next game in the Tales series. Tales of uh, Zestiria hasn't even really hit the U.S. yet. Um, so, I mean, they're just cranking these out. I know some people really love these games and they resonate with. Um, I've only really seen uh, Tales of Zillia played um, before, and, you know, it sure is a Japanese RPG game. But I think uh, I think this is good. I think this is one genre that the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, you know, this is an Xbox One game, but the PlayStation 4 kind of console cycle is really missing out on. Have you? I've never really played any of games. I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've never, never played any of the Tales games. I think Brooks has. We've mentioned these I before. Have. We like American games. <laughs> I know, after your Rockman rant. <laughs> yeah, man, don't give me symbols. I want American letters. You know what I mean? Uh, no, not American whatsoever. Um... Hyrule Warriors <laughs> yes. is coming to 3DS. Best announcement. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Alex, uh, are you familiar? Like, have you played Hyrule Warriors for weeks? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I played... I mean, it came out, like, dead middle of college, and just, like, me and all my friends, we just played the shit out of that. We're all massive Zelda fans. I had never played a Dynasty Warriors game, barely, but so I was interested in this, mainly just because of the Zelda aspect, and I adored it. I thought it was an interesting take on, like, the entire franchise and just the soundtracks booming the entire time and just to have Link wipe out, like, 90 enemies in one move is, like, one of the most satisfying feelings ever. Have you ever played a Dynasty Warriors game? Like, I don't remember the number because there's all so the same. many of them now. Yeah, they're all the same, but, I mean, a while back ago, I think it was <laughs> It was PlayStation 3, but uh, I didn't. I haven't owned a Sony product until PlayStation 4, so it was just briefly, maybe like chilling 30 minutes at a friend's house. I mean, I haven't played this game, so I don't know. So maybe like the gamepad, the 3DS transition will work out well. Um, just off the top of my head, like it seems, it seems odd. Like it seems like that smaller screen. Um, you know, the, the controls aren't as precise or as comfortable that, you know, button matching on a 3DS for that long is going to be less enjoyable than a controller. I could see that. Yeah, but, um, be really taxing, yeah. I, like, Probably. with, like, the new 3DS, and, I mean, I have, like, an XL, so the screen's relatively decent size, but, like, I've uh, been playing through, like, Xenoblade Chronicles and, like, Monster Hunter, and it's kind of like, those games are also, like, these big, wide landscapes that you wouldn't really expect to look appealing on a 3DS, but it's pulled off rather well, really, especially in Xenoblade Chronicles 3D. Yeah, I've heard nothing about you know, it's, uh, like, you know, it's the graphics and just the display on the new screen. I've, I've still been rocking the, uh, the Zelda 25th Anniversary 3DS, which is the tiny screen, and I mean... The emblazoned like uh, triforce symbols and all the you know fine detail gold, you know, finery all over it, and I'm I was hesitant to let it go. I don't really want to sell it back. And then I went to GameStop and saw the I saw the you know the the 3ds the new 3ds XL, 
and that thing, yeah, the screen is gorgeous. It's, you know, it's humongous to compare because I was playing Zelda Ocarina, I mean, uh, Majora's Mask on the uh, on my old 3DS. I was like, ah, oh, this is just this is such an old system. It's like, it's, it's small. I can't really dig it. And then I went to games something like this. It's incredible. So I, I would give something like Hyrule, I would give something like that a chance for sure. Um, I, I think you're right. Right, Crystal. Like the 3DS, even the XL. I didn't play it for very long at GameStop. I was playing Super Smash, and even that was taxing. Like it's still really small and like really weird to hold. For some reason, that I find the Vita more comfortable. Uh, I don't know if that holds true for everyone, but I would be interested to see how how you know they deal with controls and stuff like that. I hadn't played Hyrule Warriors, so I don't actually know uh, how that works, but I'm still interested. Uh, for the Vita, like, just bring that into, into question, I can't play the Vita for very long. Like, I feel like that that perfectly flat uh, controller, um, I have a, the original fat OLED, like, my hands, like, feel like claws mm-hmm. after, like, an hour or two of gameplay. Um, like, hitting those R buttons and, the, like, the tiny buttons. I like the Vita. I think it's a great piece of hardware. Um, I think it's, you know, visually impressive for a on-the-go. Um, I think there are a lot of great games for it, but it is not a sit-down-and-marathon machine. No, I would guess not. I mean, I haven't really done anything longer than, like, an hour and a half on it, you know. I mean, I played Shovel Knight on it. I played a lot of Titan Souls. I, I might have played a lot of Titan Souls, actually. Titan Souls I spent a lot of time on just because I played it, like, that weekend or something. Um, but I have the Slim, and that's definitely more comfortable than the OLED. Just, like, literally those, those pads on the back make all the difference. Just having that much more grip room, I feel. And, um... The only complaint I really have about the control screen, besides the uh, besides the small buttons, is uh, these these analog sticks keep getting in the freaking way of my thumbs. Like I'm trying to rock old school D-pad, you know, stuff on Shovel Knight, and these analog sticks get in the way, and then he, he pogo sticks down when I don't want to. It's it gets that's the only real complaint I have about it. I mean, but I love my Vita. It has like every game that I want to play on it. It's my it's my favorite console right now. Uh, a lot of people feel that way. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of people buying it. Um, yeah. Alex, I'm going to pick on you because you write for an, primarily Nintendo site. Is N- Nintendo moving games from the Wii U to the 3DS kind of the final acknowledgement that the Wii U is dead? That's a really good question. I mean, they have a lot holding on to that Wii U, and I think uh, like we talked about a lot, they want to start moving toward something new that is going to totally neglect the Wii U. What it is exactly, I'm not sure. Could it be like completely like a handheld device? Could it just be moving toward like a Super 3DS? I mean, I would be interested in that, and it's a good possibility. But I mean, right now, I mean, we still have like there's still a Zelda game that's going to come out on Wii U. There's still a supposed Star Fox game that's going to come out on Wii U. Devil's Third, and I'm still praying that we get Xenoblade Chronicles X, which is supposed to be Wii U. And, I mean, they're at least going to still push it for a bit longer until they finally just neglect it completely. I think we get Xenoblade Chronicles X. I mean, we'll get every game that you mentioned. Um, I don't think they'll pull a Twilight Princess on this uh, Legend of Zelda. They got so much slack that they can't afford to do that again. Um, But you mentioned um, Devil's Third. Uh, so, I mean, I, I saw bits and pieces of the trailer. I didn't watch all of it. It was like 10 minutes. It was mostly Japanese. But, holy shit, this surprised me. I mean, Wii U, family-friendly, pixel art. Um, but then this game just came out of nowhere on my radar and is violent and bloody and, you know... It's Ninja I mean, Gaiden. it's not like... I mean, it's the same... Is the same director as Ninja Gaiden, or is it the same, like... What is it? I forget who that guy is. He's, uh, I think... He... I think he's just the director, yeah. Yeah, he, but like, I mean, he appeared it's... On IPA and he was doing the interview. Yeah, yeah. in spirit, stuff. I mean, it's like Ninja Gaiden, pretty much. It's just that, um, this, I, maybe this is not the same game I'm thinking of, but, like, it's also got a shooter element in it. Is this, mm-hmm. am I thinking of the same game? Yeah. Yeah, it it's... slips, snaps into, like, first person, like, from third person to first person, like, real fast. Yeah. yeah that but... just seems absurd to me. Like, I'll, I, you know... I know he's he's a legend, you know, as far as you know the old, more old school games are concerned. 
But I mean, that just, like, it looked ridiculous, you know, that kind of uh, aesthetic and, and style, you know, super violent. Yeah, like, this is crazy. Yes. I'm, we're looking at the gameplay right now. It's, yes. it's a madhouse. Like, it, it's I not mean, as appealing today as it used to be, I feel. Or at least just not in the West, maybe. Maybe that's just me talking. I don't know. I mean, I think there's definitely still a place for this game. Um, and I'm not surprised that it exists. Um, and I, I probably shouldn't even be surprised it exists on Wii U, because Nintendo doesn't necessarily want to be pigeonholed. Um, I'm surprised this is a Wii U game. This just seems so outside of everything else that they publish. Um, but I don't know. Maybe they want to publish more. Maybe they do want to work with third parties more. And they're willing to work with whoever's willing to work with them, you know, regardless of the genre or the uh, age appropriateness. Uh, Brooks, do you have any thoughts on Devil's Third? Or I can see this game doing extremely well on the PS4 or the Xbox One. I am not kidding. My only concern, I mean, this game it looks interesting. It's, it's, it's fast-paced game, gameplay at times. This is exactly what a lot of these shooter, uh, a lot of these shooter fans would probably like. Something they can get into. Adventure elements and shooter elements. Yep. But how many of these shooter games are on Wii U right now? You know, that's I mean, the problem. There's five million plus people on there. How many Splatoon, of them? Splatoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem. Most hardcore yeah. shooters heard about Splatoon, decide I gotta get a Wii U. You know. Yeah. This advanced warfare stuff. That's that's the that's the only problem I see with this. It's a, it looks like a great game, but I just don't see anybody crossing over to get a Wii U to play it. It's possible, but yeah, I mean, like I'll. I would totally get it, best because I already have a Wii U. I mean, if I had a Wii U, so, I mean, be right yeah. immediately. No questions asked. Uh-oh. Our fearless leader has left the conversation. That's not he good. has left the building. <laughs> I should still oh. be here. He just, oh. stopped, he just stopped. I just stopped sharing. He just stopped Dude. sharing the video. Oh, man, that was scary. <laughs> we thought you left us. We didn't know what to do. There's no podcast without Nerd Ice. You guys can carry on. Uh, and, I mean, you know, ultimately the goal is for this to not be, um, you know, a show that could go on without me. I want this show to be on every Thursday, regardless of if I'm in town or not. So, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Be, it could just fall into shambles, you know. It could, it could, do, it could do terrible. We'll start telling awful dead baby jokes and all sorts of inappropriate things. Horrible things might happen, Chris. You don't know. Uh, I I have full faith in you guys. Um, you know, we we've hung out for a total of three hours, so I completely trust you. Um, unrelated, uh, kind of another pre E three announcement. Uh, looks like Dark Souls three is a thing. Oh, I, I take back what I said earlier about Hyrule Wars. This is the best announcement. Ah. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Mm-hmm. But. All I can say is just from software has not done anything wrong in my eyes yet, so I'm beyond I'm still hyped for this as much as I have been for the past two Dark Souls and Bloodborne. Yeah, I only just started getting back into Bloodborne. Um, I was uh, playing a lot of the hardcore games, you know, I used to be much more casual, not a casual gamer, but just playing more casual based games. And was playing a lot of hardcore games and then finally came to what Bloodborne and just couldn't handle it and I had to like put it down for like a whole month. So, because I've never played Dark Souls before, I was just like, what is this? I'm dead all the time and I don't know where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to kill, and there's no save points. Finally, I decided like, you know, the, this is the summer, I'm going to buckle down and beat this game. And I started playing it and I couldn't find a save point anyway. So I actually grabbed the game guide and the thing is like, it's like a brick it's ridiculous how much content is in this game guide. So I'm just like, oh, what did I get into? So anytime, like I said this on another podcast, but like, or another one of these episodes, but anytime something is is announced from from software, I'm just like, guys, just let me beat the game. I need like two lifetimes to really master this game. Just leave me alone for another another month. I'll beat it. I promise. So I mean, it's exciting for sure, but I'm I'm a noob in the uh, in the From Software Dark Souls hardcore world, so uh, I'm just I'm more scared than than excited when hearing something like this. Uh, when this announcement first came out, 
I'll be honest, my gut reaction was too soon. That Bloodborne came out this year, that there was I a kinda, long... I kind of get that feeling, too. And yeah, they literally thought... just released also the, the definitive version. Yeah, the, like the game of the year, like HD, Dark Souls. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's what, a month old. Like, how old is that now? Something uh, of the scholar. Scholar of the first son. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, and I don't know, and I think a lot of people are going to say that, but then I thought about it. These games are unique um, mm-hmm. to me. I mean, that'd be like saying there's too many first-person shooters because m- one a year comes out, and way more than one a year comes out. So I don't know. Like, the fact that, you know, even if From Software does make one of these games a year, if they're the only people making these types of games, then... The market's not oversaturated with it. I mean, did they give a specific release window or anything uh, like that coming early, this year? Early 2016, so oh roughly just a year from Bloodborne. Oh my god! No, that's getting delayed for sure. <laughs> no way. Yeah, I'm, I want to go with that too. I mean, From Software is known to delay games, and Bloodborne was delayed. I think it was mm-hmm. supposed to come out like fall 2014 originally. Yeah. I mean, they're they're just known for delaying, so. I'm pretty sure it'll be delayed, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, as we get into the E3 season, all this news that we're saying today, that we'll say next week, it's all going to be delayed. Like, we are looking at the best games of 2017. Yeah. Um, and now, some 2018 games. A lot of the press, you know, game press talks about very positively about delays. You know, obviously they want everyone to take their time. But, I mean, you know, now I think the messaging also is getting out there from press or from the community like us, you know, they're like, okay, get, delays are fine, but start, you know, controlling what you're, what you're trying to convey to your consumers, you know, start like waiting off and taking your time, you know, this is, this is probably, uh, this is either way too soon for Dark Souls to come out, or way too soon to be announcing it, because it's not coming out early 2060, or even fall, maybe, I don't know. There's supposed to be Bloodborne DLC. I'm sorry, I keep this kind of cutting you off, but like this, this is boggling to me. Uh, I forgot about the Bloodborne DLC. Um, maybe I don't even know if for, uh, from software knows they had to do it. Like Shuhei just kind of said that offhandedly during a uh, right. right, yeah, make it happen. Do it. Oh, we were making Dark Souls three. Do them both. Okay, fine. I agree with you on delays, um, and it frustrates me because, like, I, I get annoyed with delays, um, and I don't get annoyed with the developers of the production team, and I agree with the sentiment that, you know, delays are good for the game. But delays aren't necessarily good for the consumer, and I think that the marketing committee and uh, somebody on the publisher, somebody, whoever is announcing these dates, knows that they're doing it maliciously at this point. Like, I can't believe that they honestly think that a game that comes out two years later was ever going to hit that mark. I mean, some, either somebody in the company is lying to somebody else or somebody in the company is lying to consumers. Um, I don't care if a game takes four years to make. Just be honest about it. Don't keep pushing don't it back and around. Don't say anything, you know? Don't say anything for four years, you know? If, if, we, if I'm to believe that Fallout comes out this year, and I do genuinely believe that, you know, but that's the last game they brought out, you know, the, from Bethesda Game Studios, you know, for, uh, Skyrim. They... Announced it and released it the same year. You know, so I will believe before any other game studio was releasing this game this year. You know, we didn't. We knew about it through rumors and through speculation and through, you know, things through Walmart and like copyright, you know, uh, trademarking and stuff like that. Sorry. So that's the only way. We never heard anything from Bethesda themselves truly about Fallout till now. So that's how you should do it, you know? You don't have to be honest about it four years in advance that we hope to do this, because you know, you have no idea what that game looks like. You have no idea what you're going to run into four years ahead of time. Like, are you kidding? I just, I totally think, like, you know, I feel like we're banging the dead horse a bit. Like, I say speech episode now, but, like, just take your time and don't say anything. You know? Don't boast so much. You'll, you'll, you'll convey a stronger message as a company if you announce a game and a release date, and then stick to it, even if it's bundled into the same year. What do you think, Alex? I mean, I of course I want to agree with, like, take your time and everything. I mean, we've had so many games recently that 
drop and it's like they're still not done. And it's like, oh, we'll fix it in a patch or even better yet, you know, they fix it in like a paid DLC. But um like with from software, like they're still just getting out there. They're still they're not a relatively like big studio yet, but they produce great works. And I feel like I feel like it will be delayed and like for the consumer it's still gonna be kinda like that's a bummer, but we know you guys like working hard at it. And overall, like I was surprised to see Dark Souls three because I thought with like Bloodborne maybe they want to start moving toward other grounds other than like medieval dungeon crawler like grindy kind of thing because Bloodborne is still dungeon crawler it's still grindy but it's more fast paced and it has a different feel from Dark Souls a lot and they recently bought uh, I covered it was a bunch of trademarks that were called like soldier souls and stuff so I thought they were moving just toward a new atmosphere or something but I'll still be interested in Dark Souls 3 whenever it drops just because of the past two. Uh, Brooks, any thoughts on Dark Souls 3? Or? I think if, if they can get it out fast enough, I think it's a great idea because Bloodborne was an exclusive for the PS4 mm-hmm. and a lot of people wanted to play that game and they could unless unless they bought one. So it's a good idea to assure the consumers that another game, uh, Dark Souls 3 is going to come out to, to fill the fix for them. That's true. Um, something else that concerns me: we're in an era of AAA games with huge budgets, and when you got something like that going on, you got executives putting pressure on these developers to get the games out fast, get them out fast. They want to get their money back, as much money back as possible. So they're willing to push these games out too soon, and then hope for DLC or or uh, patches to fix them. Assuming we're just going to buy the game, and then we'll just wait for the patch to fix it. And they'll get their profit as quickly as possible. I mean, I think the the message was pretty straightforward, uh, just from press and consumers, you know, together. You know, they, the, nobody wants these, you know, day one patches to be. I mean, there's going to be day one patches no matter what at this point it seems, but they don't. We don't want this to be something we expect every single time. You know, 100% of the time. I mean, 2014 fall was kind of a mess. So I think everyone's clear now on what we want, and we don't want that, and delays are better, but we can improve on that too. You know? Oh, no doubt that we know, the consumers know, the developers know, it's just convincing these knuckleheads in the suits to um, stop you know, getting the market to guys that are sorry putting that stuff out there. Uh, definitely agree. Um, speaking of broken games, uh, Drive Club, Poster mm-hmm. Child, for Broken Game uh, of last year. Uh, comes out, uh, this just in, this wasn't on our agenda, um, that they feel like the PlayStation Plus, which was announced, I believe, when the PlayStation was announced in February of 2013. If not then, at least E3 was announced. Um, no, it was announced. Sorry, sorry, I'm backtracking. It was announced in February because it was supposed to be a launch title. Mm-hmm. That took an extra year. Finally, the PS Plus edition will come out. Yeah, I, I feel like they just wish they could just pretend this game never existed, but if they promised it, they have to come through, I guess. But it's, this is crazy. Oh, yeah, they have to come out with this. Um, they promised, they said it would be PS Plus. Um, I mean, they made a vow to the consumers. This game needs to come out uh, for them to save any face whatsoever, even if it's, like, two years later. I mean, it's still better than never. Um, I have PS Plus. I'm a huge PlayStation proponent. I had no interest to play this game. I have even negative interest to play this game now. Um, But for people who are, I'm glad it's coming out. Um, All right, moving on. Um, I guess our main topic, uh, unless there's anything else you guys wanted to cover, is uh, kind of it's kind of being billed as an E3 press conference, which flew under my radar until I. Saw it uh, on the books today. Um, Oculus Rift came out with a, a slew of announcements. Um, maybe we'll just go through them one by one, or um, if there's one that you guys want to jump in, we'll jump around. Um, but the one that stuck out to me the most was a partnership with Microsoft. Um, yeah, that's I... great. <laughs> Coming to Xbox, baby. One and oh, baby. Uh, if, you listen, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, uh, Joe predicted Microsoft and HoloLens uh, would... 
That's right. Microsoft and Hololens. Oculus so you Rift. predicted Hololens. You were like, nah. nah I know. Joe. They got the Hololens. You just, you just stop. <laughs> But I, I was believing it. No, no, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, you definitely gloat. You, you got one right. Um, it's going to be the only one you got right, so you should be proud of it. Oh, well, yeah, the other predictions were Phil Spencer makes a, a penis joke or something like that, and uh, uh, and Steam goes to Xbox, because I didn't know we were going to have three predictions, so I was just making up absurdities. And But, I mean, the penis joke might happen. I don't know. I don't know how, how racy Phil Spencer is ready to, to go, but I mean, but I'm one of them, baby. I'm, I'm going to sit on that. <laughs> uh, definitely early lead, but I mean, um, they, they even said, they even addressed my HoloLens theory, and they said that, mm-hmm. that HoloLens is AR, augmented reality, and Oculus Rift is virtual reality, and they're not competing yep. with each other. They can exist in the same space. They, um, they will now. They are going to exist <laughs> in literally the same space. Uh, Alex, did you catch this? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, like I said, I just recently saw it today. Um, I've never really like looked into Oculus Rift all that much. Like I still think it's um, I won't use the term far fetched because we clearly have it, but like I just don't see it being like a plausible thing coming to like everybody's like living room in the next at least mm-hmm. five years or so. I mean, I haven't personally like use it or anything, and a lot of people have, and people think it's, like, really awesome, but I just kind of veer away from it, because it's just kind of like, you know, I'm not going to have this, I'm not going to be sitting down playing, like, all my games with this within the next five or six years or so, like, but I feel like Microsoft, they might be able to help kind of push that even more, that's, like, with Microsoft, I think it can be five to six years that we'll see more, like, Oculus Rift around us. My, um, main thing with Oculus Rift is... It's a peripheral, and no matter how good a peripheral it is, it's still an add-on, and we've never seen an add-on succeed, in my opinion. So maybe this can break the mold, um, but I just don't see it clicking with mainstream. I mean, when you tell somebody that an Oculus Rift requires an Xbox One, which is another 350, or it requires a state-of-the-art PC, which is like $1,000, like that's just a huge investment for anybody to break into. And, like, I always feel like this, I guess I kind of feel like this for Oculus Rift 2 is, like, all these add-ons, they're always so gimmicky. Like, just motion gaming, it's just so much of, like, a shtick, and it's some, it died relatively fast for, like, how big it was hyped up. And I just feel like it's it's kind of gimmicky to kind of push, like, Oculus Rift, kind of to push virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, Brooks, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have three actually. One, <laughs> yeah. One, are they going to have and demonstrate any type of software to justify the cost this thing is probably going to have? Two, are there any potential safety problems that they haven't uncovered yet? And three, are they going to demonstrate it up at E3? Have a mock-up on stage. I, I imagine they'll have a mock-up. I that they'll have booths. I think we'll see a lot of press playing this at E3. Um, Safety concerns? It's a great question. I mean, your mom always said you'd go blind if you sat too close to the television. This is strapping a television right to your face. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things. It's like just the idea of implementing VR to just people in general, to humans. It's like, you know, how's this going to affect everyone? You know, this hasn't really reached the masses, nor may it ever, you know, considering what Alex said. Um, But like, this is this is still something we don't know much about, you know, the uh, the long term repercussions of something like this, um, whether it be you know health uh, health concerns or even just morality concerns. You know, these types of things are cannot be known really until we go all in and actually, you know, or just you know everyone buys one. And like what you said, Alex, you know, that's that's probably not going to happen. This is not for the math. This is not the mainstream. This is uh, clearly the people who are going to be buying this are the people who, for one, already know about it, and two, who see it and use it. You know, again, like we addressed it with during our E3 predictions, it's really hard to demonstrate in a press conference specifically how something like this works. You know, you can do it at a, at a booth, 
and then Expo. You know, the, the Oculus and all these other VR headsets have done really well and have had really positive feedback just from the press and what, from what I've read at expos and places where you can try it out yourself, you know. But if the messaging is off and awkward and weird, then no one's going to buy into it. Um, but I honestly still believe, like, Oculus is really, now Oculus specifically is really on the rise, especially after all these announcements. A lot of the questions were, like, is there going to be software supporting it? Yes. Is there going to be, you know, is it going to be on a console? Yes, we have Morpheus and the Oculus now. Is it, like, is is it going to come out ever? That was a question at one point, and now we know everything's dated for 2016. It's an exciting time, I think, for virtual reality. I just hope it works and, it, you know, they get the messing, messaging across well, especially at E3. You know, honestly, best thing to do probably, probably, sorry, is to just, you know, not go to in-depth on it at the actual press conference and let the booths just do what they do because they've been doing well. So, honestly, I hope it goes well. It's all about the messaging and it's all about, yeah, like, you know, support from software and stuff. And, I mean, so many companies now just outed themselves as, like, we're behind Oculus Rift. You know, Square Enix is a huge one. So, it's it'll be interesting to see how this press conference, you know, uh, bodes for the future of virtual reality. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one thing, um, they do have software to support it. Um, and so a surprisingly large amount for, for me, for Oculus being kind of small beforehand. Um, one of the people is Insomniac. Uh, they, Ratchet and Clank, like we mentioned before, and Sunset Overdrive, which is also confirmed. But then also in Oculus, exclusive um, Edge of Nowhere. Um, that's what's showing right now. What sticks out to me most is it looks like a third-person game, which you would think would be kind of an odd uh, choice for the Oculus environment. you think you would it would be a natural fit for a first-person uh, view, but, I mean, they still kind of have that over-the-shoulder camera going on. Other people have, like, messed with that, too, because actually... Um Dark Souls 2 was messed around with a little bit for a while with Oculus Rift also from Firm Software. That's probably, I mean, I would assume that's just because it's a hardcore game. Hardcore yeah. gamers are the ones we're using these Oculus things. But uh, again, yeah, like like you said, Chris, I mean, this is, this both of the games that I've seen, you know, the small gameplay trailers they were, you know, they both looked like they were kind of built in some kind of Unreal Engine type thing, you know, they they weren't the most graphically, you know, absurd titles to see, uh, but also, yeah, the, the third person just doesn't seem like the way to go. Like the the language they're using to describe these games, you know, you hear things like atmospheric and uh, immersive. Those are exactly what you think of when you think of VR. But you know, third person over the shoulder, yeah, that's totally weird. Um, there's the the Insomniac game definitely looks third person. The other game, uh, the the Labyrinth one, I think the, I forget who's behind that. I don't know if I'm confusing the same two games, but that we haven't seen anything that looks truly like gameplay. It's more just um, just shots of the actual game. It could be outside of the player's perspective, so we don't know if that's uh, first person or third person. But yeah, just honestly, yeah, Oculus going for third person over the shoulder is a weird. Uh, way to go for an exclusive, for sure. Uh, yeah, and one other thing uh, I want to call out um, is the fact that part of the Microsoft sponsorship, each Oculus is going to come with a wireless Xbox controller, which is kind of the, the staple controller um, right now, which doesn't mean a lot, but it does, it does give me hope that Oculus will have hardcore game experiences, controller in hand, and then this is just there to kind of emphasize the visuals, much like headphones are there for sound. Yeah, I know um, when... Uh, we're going to get to it, but, you know, those new controllers that they have, the... Uh, I forget what they're called, but the uh, basically the motion controllers... Are there. There, you go, there you go on the screen. The, uh, they, when they were talking about that, the messaging was, like, we want players to be able to reach out and 
feel more immersed in the experience. But yes, the controllers, you know, games are always going to be with a controller in your hand. So I think that they'll still, for sure, be sticking to, you know, their controllers and, and to the Xbox controller and just the like. Because, you know, they these guys are gamers. They know what works for games, and it's and it's pretty clear that that's that they have every intention of, you know, using this as, for certain game experiences, but not try to, uh, not try to move away from con- console controllers. Brooks, what are, what's your opinion on these uh, controllers? Uh, wow, <laughs> that's unusual. I'm just hoping that they'll work for uh, they'll have games. Not just like, you know, what we have, what we can get on the console. I mean, something that's specifically made for a virtual experience. And how these controls will work on them. They're not interested in, uh, you know, like over-the-shoulder uh, shooters or anything. I mean, an actual, an actual virtual reality game that you can actually get into. That, that's, it's, like, it's like a first-person, not a first-person, like a first-person exploration game or something like that. That actually has it's your, it's your point of view as you go through the game. Chris, do you want to give us some pers- uh, context on the controls? Like, I forgot what they were called. Uh, just so. Uh, I, you know, yeah. yeah, they are called the um, Oculus Motion Controls uh, Touch Controller, um, and their <laughs> main. Never mind. Uh, their their main, um, like you kind of saw, they have the uh, the grip and the straps, and they are supposed to be able to see how your hands operate if you point at something where they are in space in relationship to your own body. Um, so one of the things that a lot of uh, people who have purchased a dev kit have said in the past is that you start playing Oculus Rift, and it's really disconcerting to look down at your hands, and you see hands there, and then you move your hands in the real world in front of your face, but then your character doesn't move. Right. These controllers, in theory, are going to fix that. Um, so that way that you would be able to have some more motion and, and fluidity to it. Um, They showed the controllers, but they didn't show the controllers in tandem with any gameplay or anything. So it's still, to me right now, it's the same as the Kinect demo, um, which was, you know, if you remember that first trailer with a kid holding up his skateboard to a camera and friends talking to each other, like in a holodeck, like, until we actually see... That was the most amazing thing ever, yeah. I mean, that Kinect would do great. I mean, if that's what it was, like, everybody would... (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, we're still far off. Um, so I think that the controllers, to Brooke's point, I think that the controllers actually are important um, to creating a unique VR experience, which I think is going to be the most difficult part for the Oculus Rift and all of them, uh, all the VR headsets, is market segmentation. Who is this for? Is this a peripheral for gamers to visually enjoy the games that they've already played and now, or is this a new experience. And I don't know the answer for what the market wants at this time. Alex, any thoughts? I mean, nope. I, I can't... I think I've already said, like, everything you really say about <laughs> Oculus, and I mean, the controllers... I don't know. I really don't know what to say. I mean, I <laughs> said everything I want to say. I mean, if Oculus itself isn't going to you know, speak to you, then obviously the controllers is even worse. Like honestly, like I'm so pumped for Oculus. You know, I want it to be as good as I, I imagine it in my mind to be. You know, I've never actually used it, so I I keep talking all this positive, you know, uh, talk about the Oculus and VR in general. But I do want to say I haven't tried any of it, but I'm just I hope it's good. But even me, who's you know really hopeful for the future of VR, uh, I see these controls. I'm like, God, I'm so done on motion controls. It hasn't worked yet. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not for me. Um, but I mean, yeah, like if again, just like anything else, if they implement it well and if it's built from the ground up, which it clearly seems to be, um, but at the same time pays respect to what makes a video game click and work and then it'll work. I mean, as far as I could conceptualize, this looks like the best of both worlds, you know, keeping to what game what makes controlling games good. As well as you know, getting into motion controls. I don't know. I'm I'm honestly sick of motion controls. I could I if if I were playing Oculus, I don't know if I need that. Honestly, like the best places for Oculus is probably you know 
piloting type things like driving games or or like Eve or whatever that uh, space combat game is. Because that make sense for your hands to be just on some control panel or you know a controller, whereas you know something like what you're suggesting, Chris, which is you know we don't know, like maybe more atmospheric experiences rather than video games. Uh, that may not work as well with the controller. It would work as well with the controller or keyboard and mouse. So I don't know. You know, it's it, we are really. It's very interesting the time we're in. We are really now finally, truly questioning what is a video game anymore. You know, uh, uh, it's it's definitely something. Just that by itself is what interests me in Oculus Rift. Besides just wanting to roam GTA uh, with uh, you know Oculus goggles on. Uh, well, I think Rift is the the clear winner right now. Um, that's what Morpheus and I can't even remember what uh, the other one is. Nvidia Vive, the the one that uh, Nvidia Vive. Vive is the uh, the Valve uh, produced one. Right with something. with Nokia. And then in, yeah, well, I don't know. No, Nvidia the Nokia is like you know using the phone or it's from Samsung or something. But then Samsung's also working with Oculus, I forget. But the Vive, I thought, was like a whole other thing. It was like a helmet and like a whole like suit that you wear from the way IGN described it. You know, like you go in space and you put on a suit. I don't know. But, but yeah, there's like a million. There were, at one point, even this year, not a million, several of these, uh, you know, VR sets. And now, obviously, the two that came to the front first, uh, Oculus and Project Morpheus, are clearly, like you said, yeah, the winners right now. So we will wait and see which one ends up coming up on top. Um, I think that covers pretty much everything from the conference. Uh, just wrapping up our last segment, uh, what have you guys been playing this past week? Uh, Brooks, what games have you been into? Uh, I'm still playing Star Wars Battlefront 2. Okay. In preparation for Battlefront... Uh, yes. Yeah. Getting a fever. What about you, Alex? Uh, Heroes of the Storm. That's mainly what I've been putting my time toward right now. So, Have you been playing it for a while, or just since uh, the beta? I didn't get. I didn't play the beta. Um, like I played MOBAs. I played Dota 2, and I played Smite. And I definitely, I I love Blizzard as a company. Um, I play World of Warcraft, and I played Diablo 3 for a good bit. So uh, I was definitely interested in Heroes of the Storm, and I, I, it's just really fun. Um, it's definitely not as competitive as the other ones have been. So it's just like, it's like the one MOBA you want to play whenever you just like want to have a really fun time with friends. Very teamwork based. There's not as much focus on you as there is in like Dota or Smite. Uh, thanks for touching on that. I was going to ask how the communities uh, differ from each other. Um, so do you have a dedicated team of people to play here to the Storm with, or are you not playing with a bunch of randos? Uh, I play with a mixture of um, the people with the guild I'm in on WoW, and then my other friends that I play like Dota and Smite with. I kind of have like the same people I play MOBAs with, just because we kind of... Once we played, like, one MOBA together, you kind of know, like, like me, it's like, oh, Alex is going to play kind of like the tanky guy, and he can take damage while we, like, run around and kind of, like, kill everybody around him. So you kind of know how to read each other. So I guess you kind of say there's a dedicated team, but it's just kind of a mixture. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what have you been playing, Jeff? Um, I swear I'm going to play Bloodborne. I swear I am. But uh, I... Bef- before that, I actually grabbed uh, from a humble bundle uh, Braid, which I had never actually played. I played a lot of the real popular, you know, indies from that time, like Limbo and Super Meat Boy and all that stuff. Never played Braid, and I had literally just finished it today, and I was contemplating that because that that was kind of trippy. Uh, that's a really excellent game. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand it yet. I'm definitely going to try and play it again and figure out what the hell the game is about. But uh, on my off time, just like, you know, in between, you know, commutes or whatever, I'm actually playing a lot of Hearthstone on my phone. And uh, that's got me hardcore addicted. So, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for sharing. 
I've been playing nothing. Um, I've been writing and setting up interviews and uh, preparing for E3 coverage. So I, quite frankly, haven't had time to play anything this past week. Um, Sounds like a true gaming journalist, not playing uh-huh. games at all. Uh, so I think the next really kind of big game that I'm looking forward to is Batman Arkham. Uh, I'll, I'll think I'll pick that up and I'll make the time to make sure I play that game. All right. Um, well, if you're out there still listening, thank you. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode, uh, especially as soon as you stuck around. Um, if you want to hear more from us, um, I'm Chris Peterson. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at NerdyXP. Uh, I have a blog uh, that I post interviews and thoughts on gaming, movies, and comics at NerdyXP.com. And I also do another podcast on Tuesdays about movies and television, uh, the Nerdy XP Cinecast. Um, I want to thank uh, Alex for coming on for his first time. Um, Alex, where can people find more of your work at? Uh, they can find me at Gamnesia, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at ArtisticishAlex. I post all articles I write there, and you can find me ranting and raving about anything from video games to comics to movies to anime. So. All right. uh, what, uh, what's your favorite anime that you're watching right now? I just finished the first part of Magi, which is uh, Labyrinth of Magic, and uh, I'll probably start on the second part, but I'm still trying to find a way to get to season two of Psycho Pass, because I adored that series. Yeah, it's a good series. Um, I don't think it's on any of the legal streaming yeah, it's not right legal. now. It's not, you know, I, I tried to start getting into Fate Stay Nights by, you know, other methods, but, um... I kind of like faltered out, and I'm like, I'm just going to wait until I can, you know, get it all through at once. I don't like Fate Stay Night. I watched the, uh... uh yeah, because, like, oh. I watched Fate Zero, and I adored Fate Zero. I thought it was amazing. Um, I thought it was moving at times. Just, it's incredibly well done. And Fate Stay Night was, um, totally different atmosphere. It's way more lighthearted. It's, uh, not as serious, and it just kind of took me off at first, but I, I still want to kind of give it another try, because I think the universe is interesting. I like the setup of the universe. <laughs> oh, the universe of the... I thought you just meant the universe in general. I'm like, no, yeah. No, 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 like, 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 <laughs> the, the world the, world the series creates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Alright, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Uh, oh, you can find me at uh, Joey Dagabonuts on Twitter, and you can find me at my IGN. Uh, under Joy Dega Bonus, and uh, I'm currently working on a real hardcore project for my IGN, uh, which is partially why I was playing Braid as like a research thing. So please, if anyone's listening, uh, I normally don't panhandle myself too hardcore, but please check check my blog out if you're listening recently. So my IGN, Joy Dega Bonus. All right, uh, and what about you, Brooks? You can follow me on Twitter at NavyMVG, or you can read my blogs or check me out in my IGN at Military Veteran Gamer. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Brooks. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Joe. I definitely appreciate you guys. Um, and thank you out there for listening. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode and that we were able to help you with your gaming IQ. Level up, friends.